Hello. Hello. Uh, I'm Max from Blabaka. Welcome to this talk for Pekona Live. Uh, it, it will not be really live today. Uh, is it uh, pre-recorded? Uh, but uh, let's try to to be good and, uh, and thanks again Pekona for keeping the event alive. Uh, so today I will try my best to tell you the, the story of one of the biggest team success uh, of these two past years, uh, which was organized the migration of an Android database uh, to the cloud. A uh, quick word about me. I joined Blobacar in 2014 uh, as a database specialist, and I am now engineering manager uh, for a wonderful team called Database Reliability Engineering. And I used to say that my job is to make the database not a problem. So it's quite easy now. Uh, but more seriously, in the DBR team, we basically have two missions. Um, we are packaging reliable database system and provide expertise in software engineering to help teams uh, choose the right database for them and be sure that they, they use it uh, the, the right way. Um, so Blabacar. Blabacar is a, is a community-based marketplace. Uh, we are known for our carpooling application, but uh, since a few years now, we propose bus offer uh, with an ambitious to become the, the go-to marketplace for, for shared travel. And in terms of activity, Blabacar is quite huge. Uh, it is 22 countries, uh, near 100 million members with different offers like buses, long distance carpooling, but also short distance with Blabacar daily. Uh, it's a product designed for, for commuting. And in terms of growth, uh, well, since a, a decade now, we can see the trend of our user base has skyrocketing. And obviously the, the big challenge for us tech team is to build reliable infrastructure to, to support this growth. And um, we, sh we should manage teams and system to not be a like, blocker, but uh, an enabler for, for, for this company and for this growth. Um, in 2018, I participated to Percona Live Europe to present our infrastructure and how we manage to have all our databases running into container. And for us, this, this was a big step uh, in building scalable infrastructure, like bootstrapping new databases become easy and the service discovery make the overall platform really dynamic. Um, but however, we were running all this infra on bar metal servers and we were at a time when we needed to choose between scale our data center by buying more servers or decide to get rid of the hardware and moving um, to the cloud. And guess what? Early 2019, Blabacar has signed a contract with Google and the tech team were about to start a two years journey of uh, migration from the on-premise bar metal infrastructure to Google Cloud Platform. Um, here's what looked like the database infrastructure in 2019. Uh, we had eight products and about 900 production clusters. Of course, most most of the core data is hosted in MySQL, but all of these backend have near the same criticality. So, you can easily guess the number of migration scenario we we had to implement. And uh, frankly, it was a, a lot. In few words, um, this was the mission. So first, it, it, it was time-based. Uh, we signed a contract in 2019. And even if we haven't any hard deadline, the objective was to close our on-premise data center end of 2020, so two years. Uh, then for my team, DBRE, uh, we had to staff as we were only two people at the beginning of the process, two engineers to package seriously eight products and accompany dozens of application migration will, will not be possible. So my first priority then was to rebuild a team that will be able to take uh, that uh, challenge. Uh, and finally, the mission itself was clear. It's package reliable database system, accompany the migration and important, decommission the on-premise resource. And here we are. The first part of the mission was completed. In addition of one SRE with a focus on distributed databases and myself, engineering manager, with also a database background, we had a dedicated product owner 
um, her role was key. She helped us in gathering requirements for our user, having an eye on all topics related to the migration, but um, she also organizing the communication with the right level of detail. Um, then uh, we decided to hire an SRE with a strong background in cloud and Kubernetes pattern. Because in the context of moving complicated workloads like databases, uh, into like a, a new platform, the, the experience on the platform itself was more valuable than the database skills. So it allowed us to, to avoid basic traps, promoted best opportunities or uh, enforced um, best practices. Um, and also, uh, yeah, I, I usually avoid hiring a run product expert, but we did an exception for the Kafka ecosystem. Because the, the multi-tenant nature of an event, uh, uh, the, the of, of, of an event bus platform requires a full-time implication during the design process. And on premise, we did have Kafka brokers, connectors, and schema registry, but we failed at many points that will become a showstopper in the future. So we, we, we took the opportunity of the cloud migration to reboot this topic and hire a real Kafka expert responsible for, for accompanying teams like doing the, the, the right choices. And finally, uh, the third requirement that completed the team was a senior SRE. Uh, we was really like that type of enthusiastic with good experience in the domain. So his ability to jump with interest on all the database software tasks was really game changing for me and the, and the migration. Uh, it was really a, a good fit for, for, for the challenge. Um, I did not mention here, but in 2021, so this year, we had a bit of turnover. So with a new product owner, uh, one senior SRE, but also one uh, junior SRE. So not a big team, but enough to deliver and small uh, to have like a good communication level. So fly me to the cloud. <laughs> Let's go. Uh, what is crazy with the cloud is the ton of possibilities you have. Uh, it, it is probably why the cloud is the go-to place for most of the company, as the, the amplitude between the different solutions is, uh, is huge. In one side, you can like control everything you want from the virtual machine to the load balancer. And in the other side, you can do serverless. And there are as many in-between solutions. It is uh, awesome. Uh, but it is also a big source of mistakes, like thinking that things will just work magically because it is managed by Google, or minimizing a, a product overhead, minimizing the cost, uh, risking to be locked in a, in a solution. The, the multiplication of the possibilities in, implies also, for sure, uh, a, a multiplication of the risks. So, as a database team, we had to have a clear vision on how we see things and how we wanted to integrate the database packaging into the blah, blah, blah of the whole platform. I have listed here four possibilities, a compute engine, which is basically just installing databases into virtual machine, Kubernetes with GKE, uh, using Google managed services like Cloud SQL, Bigtable, and so on. And finally, the GCP marketplace, which is a, a catalog when you can, can purchase software as a service like MyDB Sky SQL, uh, Elastic Cloud, uh, Confluent Cloud, uh, and, and so on. Uh, on Compute Engine, we knew that the target infrastructure for stateless services will be Kubernetes. So even if we were a bit scared of, of targeting Kubernetes for databases, it was not really comfortable to have a dedicated infrastructure with dedicated privacy management, different monitoring integration. And, and usually it is now in team DNA, we do our best to make the database not an exception. We want to manage a database service as we manage a, an application service. This is where I mentioned here, try to avoid because we knew that if we could not do the job in other solution, we will have to, to do a custom infrastructure based on Kubernetes, uh, sorry, uh, compute engine. But I wanted to avoid the scenario at maximum. So it's trying to avoid. And yeah, I said previously, uh, it, it's now in the team DNA to try having the database platform using the same pattern as the main services. So running database into Kubernetes, so GKE, Geeky is here. Uh, it was the plan. It, it was my my preferred approach uh, in the vision. Uh, 
there, there are many advantages to use the same phrase than, than all other teams. Uh, you are in the same life cycle. You don't miss like a security upgrade, for example. Uh, you use the same patterns and tools than everyone, like uh, for CI, for CD, a monitoring tool. So if you have an issue or question, it, it is way easier to find help from, from other teams. From, so it, it is more comfortable for, for us. And, and obviously, Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes is really powerful. It, it is unleashing a lot of possibilities in terms of reliability, scalability, security. It's a, it's a super platform. So it's preferred. Uh, then surely you sign with a, a, a cloud provider. You should look at the managed services. Uh, surely it offers a quick way to have the product ready to use and supported by the provider. So it is great. That being said, you should avoid to rush on, on this uh, easiest choice and take the time to do serious make or buy analysis. Um, comparing what level of reliability do you need, what feature you need uh, and, and not need, uh, what is the usage you are about to do with the product, like volumetry, throughput, what level of support do you need? Like does opening a case the provider support when you have an issue is enough? Or, or do you need a local team in your company uh, to, to, to accompany you on, on building and, and maintaining the service? So in this slide, I put a do, but with some warning on it, and it, it was the same in, uh, in the plan. The fourth solution is to use the software as a service offered in GCP Marketplace. A uh, lot of software providers are focused on developing this business line, maybe all, uh, looking at MongoDB Atlas, MyDB Sky SQL, uh, Elastic Cloud, uh, and many others. But maybe it, it will be the, the, the way to go in the future, and everyone uh, will use uh, this uh, when they go in Clone Infra. But for us, they are currently the wrong mix of being not a Google product and not packaged by us either. So as for now, and, and regarding uh, our constraint and our, and our yeah, volume, uh, it's not the plan. So it's, it's a don't. OK, um, a bit of management here. Uh, one of the key for us was to be transparent on our choices and our deliveries. I did, did not dig into the detail when I showed you the slide regarding the, the 2018 Percona Live talk, but during this first migration in, in the containers, a uh, lot of design choices uh, has been made by the infrastructure team only. And without so much consultation uh, on the needs and requirements from the dev team. And this resulted of creating sort of a, a black box for the team, which has, which, which has a side effect on a daily basis and frankly was not really fun uh, at the end. And this is for, for this, uh, for this migration, we, we want to be more inclusive uh, to ensure having the buying, uh, having the buying of the of the user. Sorry, um, I thought it was important to introduce some of the concepts we put in place to to increase the trust and confidence in this presentation because it was a strong indicator for us. Uh, we, we wanted to build things in collaboration with the developer to be sure that we are doing the the right choices. It is not a, a, an infrastructure migration; it's a, it's company migration. So first, uh, we had to be clear on the process uh, and the level of readiness to, to be sure that all our users are understanding the path from the proof of concept until the go-to prod. Um, we have chosen to use a classic uh, alpha, beta, j denomination. And for the alpha, for example, we were focused on the test of the infrastructure and the exploration of different components like managed services, storages, Kubernetes resources. The, the, the work consisted of doing proof of concept, make or buy, benchmark. It, it was simply to, to have a good overview of the software capabilities, MyDB, Redis, Cassandra, in the, the, the GCP infrastructure. Uh, in parallel, uh, we started a discussion with the developer team to gather the requirements. It was really important. So for each database, uh, we ask some basic questions. 
Like, will your database be migrated or abandoned? Uh, can you support the downtime for the migration? And how long could it be? Can we migrate the read separately from the write? And all these questions allow us to drive our development into different direction based on the user requirement. So it was really central on, on the development. Uh, also, apart from few exceptions, we did not expose the alpha release to our users. They were pure test release. And it was changing like every day, so it was too unstable for application usage, but it was clear from the beginning. It is alpha, so not usable for now. Uh, and this is where the beta is coming now. Uh, basically, we call it also ready to industrialize as it is when you turn your POC into a real uh, database as a service. The goal was to consolidate our release to be rollable uh, and scalable while offering stable in, uh, interface, really important. So no more breaking change, and we can then open the database uh, for testing because it's stable. We enter into a, like a continuous improvement process, working on new features, observability, documentation, and so on but the interface to contact the DB uh, should be stable. And finally, the ready to prod version, so the GA, uh, was the continuity of the data packaging, but with enough confidence to say, okay, we, we can go with packaging. Uh, obviously, we are constantly improving things, huh? writing a book or create new monitoring dashboard or alert, but GA tells green light for the migration. So three versions and clear iteration. Another critical topic was the transparency in the decision process. Um, often, the, the documentation exposed the latest version of the idea. And when updated, it erased the past and hides the story that led to the final version, the, the, the final decision. So the goal was to have an append-only documentation where each block is preceded by a date. And it, it gives the overall decision process from point A to point B. And as time goes by, when someone questions why is it did this and not this, you can read the decision log and ask the story uh, behind it. So in, the, in that slide, you can see an extract of the decision log about MySQL in GCP. And you can see the back and forth between using Cloud SQL only, Kubernetes only, what limitation we discover that could prevent us uh, to, to use a solution or design and so on. So try it. Uh, it's a bit heavy to write and maintain, but it, it has really a tremendous value. You can stop it uh, after the migration, but during the, the, the development process, it's uh, really cool. Uh, so Runbooks, uh, we use Runbook for years now. We took the idea from GitLab, which segmented the Runbook with two questions. How to do when, describing an action plan to answer uh, an incident, and how to hide detailing a practical task on the product. So this is great, uh, thanks uh, GitLab. <laughs> uh, approaching the documentation uh, through these two questions turn the writing more practical and, and straight to the point. So it's little tips. And finally, a bit further in the process, we implemented something called the classroom. Uh, where we try to reprocess the documentation and the knowledge as a game, or at least some uh, adding some rewarding behind the learning. Um, you can see the two level in the slide. In the same way as the RAND book, we, we try to make the documentation like not boring. Uh, it was um, with level is pretty cool. Uh, you, you can create sort of like a skill matrix with level, product, and engineer, and then you, you have a good view of where are the, the single point of failure in the team, where to put the motivation first, and, and so on. So like, yeah, give me find uh, the knowledge. OK, so I spent a bit of time on the context uh, and the orga. So let's move on the, on the implementation. Um, as you know now, we, we, we had a product uh, to, to migrate. And I do not mention Coachbase uh, here, as we replace our Coachbase use cases by, uh, by Redis. So one, uh, one less problem. 
um, in, you can see in, in one slide here uh, a big picture of the timeline. Uh, in blue, uh, it is the, the kickoff day of the product. Uh, in green, the first migration. And in dark uh, purple, the, the, the last cluster decommission uh, on premise. So it is an interesting view. As you can see, that we, we do a lot of things in parallel, but depending on the solution, uh, we were able to go to prod in more or less time. Like uh, there are more there are like significant message uh, in the day game. Uh, for example, you can see that MyDB was the first work launch, which is logic. That is the main data store, uh, blah blah blah, and and the product in which we have the most experience in. Uh, you can see also that the first MyDB production cluster was migrated like one year after the kickoff. It is mainly because the MyDB packaging was done in house. In comparison, you can see the first memory store was created a like few months after Redis kickoff, uh, as long as Cloud SQL for, for PostgreSQL. And uh, here is the big advantage of using managed services. You, you can ship them like really quickly. Uh, okay, so anyway, I found nice to sum up like all the story in the in the Seagull slide. Uh, it shows the scale of that project and hope it is uh, understandable and, uh, and useful. Um, but concretely, uh, I told you a few words about the DBRE uh, vision regarding the different possibilities, like Kubernetes, managed services, and so on. But technically, what was our guidelines? Uh, first, we had to understand and masterize the Kubernetes state rule set. Uh, this is the key resource for our database team, um, as it, it, it provides a way to safely manage stateful application in Kubernetes, so it is the, the basic. Um, then in Kubernetes, there are some pod specification called affinity, like node affinity, pod affinity, and so on. And we are using it to guarantee that our cluster are evenly distributed along GCP zone. Uh, and, and with a clean configuration, we can ensure that our database can support uh, a zone lost without impact. So it's quite important for us. Um, third, about disk, uh, it was our first job during the project. We have tested different Google solutions to understand the feature and the limit of each possibilities, like local disk, persistent disk, regional, zonal, SSD, not SSD. We did some benchmarking with database tooling. Uh, we decided to, to prefer Google persistent disk over local SSD. Um, it was key for us to validate the perf of this distant disk, as they bring us a lot of flexibility in managing attached resources. Um, also, uh, there is no limit in volumetry, uh, which is cool for non-distributed uh, databases like uh, MySQL, um, because in local disk, the, the, the volumetry is like three terabytes, and we have our monolith of two terabytes, so it's, it's, it's a bit short. Um, and another pillar was to implement distributed ownership. We are not a DBA team, we are SRE, with a specialization in database. Our role is to package services, but the service itself is owned by the developer team. So in Kubernetes, every resources are in the namespace. And we, we decided to create the database in the application namespace, instead of having like a database or DBRE namespace. And by doing so, the developer are root on their databases, and so also they can by default receive the level one alert so it's more convenient and as we are transitioning to a service oriented architecture with devops concept um, it was important for us to to promote uh, this pattern uh, and last but not least for all managed services so outside kubernetes the core infrastructure team is promoting the the usage of terraform uh, to control the uh, google resources so it it allows the team to package the, the Google resources while staying in a, in a infra as code uh, philosophy in a, and best practices. So I will not cover all the product. Uh, at which it will took, uh, or it will take uh, all the day, but uh, I picked some that are representative of the overall migration. 
And first, obviously, it's uh, MySQL. So here is uh, what looked like a MySQL service uh, on-premise in 2019 uh, before the cloud. Uh, we were using a Galera cluster for main access. Sometimes we also had some asynchronous nodes behind the Galera cluster to do some batch queries and, uh, and low priority select. And all the endpoint was accessed dynamically thanks to our service discovery. Um, so to, to keep the diagram simple, I just mentioned this service discovery as a HA proxy because it is the main point of the, our service discovery, but yeah, there is a bit of magic between the app and the databases. Uh, on the left, you can see that the app is using three different endpoints, uh, one for read, uh, which goes to the Galera nodes, one for write, which go to only one node at a time, and one endpoint for asynchronous read, which goes to the, to the replica. During the, the alpha phase of the packaging, I told you that we were asking some questions to gather the requirement for the different team. So the first one was, uh, will your database be migrated or abandoned? And from MySQL, we, we know uh, that we will continue using MySQL uh, and most of the cluster will be migrated. So the, the, the question was simple to answer. However, we profited from the cloud migration to mutualize the small databases when uh, it, it had sense. But because having small databases, it, it's cool, uh, but having too many, it's expensive. So uh, we running, maintaining, so by merging things together, uh, I think we have today like 30% uh, fewer clusters than, uh, than on-premise. So we, we will have to package MySQL, but maybe less clusters. The second question was, what is um, the tolerated downtime for the migration? Well, for some use cases, we were able to stop the client completely. Uh, and some databases also uh, had a read-only pattern. Obviously, that is the migration. Uh, nevertheless, for most of the application, only uh, like a, a few seconds of downtime or a minute of downtime would be allowed uh, during the migration. Um, so we had basically the two opposite patterns, like really safe and really critical. And the last question, can we migrate the read separately from the write? Uh, seen in the diagram, we already exposed several endpoints for read and for write, so no big change uh, will be required uh, in, uh, in the application. So honestly, um, it is the only case we have of two packaging for the same product. Because we decided to support Cloud SQL and in an in-house MyDB solution. And it is the, the only case. Uh, even if we can't pull all our production into Cloud SQL, we decided to choose it for, for, for some specific use cases because uh, we, we thought it was interesting. For example, if the application is okay with the Cloud SQL SLA, uh, which, could, which can frankly result in a one or two minutes of downtime for simple operation like a scale up or upgrade, for instance. Um, secondly, the application right stream can be stopped during the, the data set migration. Um, yeah, and a note here that in our case, we could not uh, have a non premise MySQL replicated into a Cloud SQL. It was mainly because the, the incompatibility of the replication, GTID, MariaDB, MySQL, and so on. So we know that for migrate into Cloud SQL, we had to dump the data set to have the data. And uh, so during that uh, dump, blocking completely the write. So it was OK, uh, as the migrated databases was read-only, or, or, or the write was done like asynchronous uh, by, a, by an asynchronous worker which can be stopped for, for a while. So for, for, for the use case, we migrate into Cloud SQL, it was completely okay, but it's not the case for, for all the MySQL use case. Finally, the third point, it's about the size of the use case. Uh, and it was true for the migration, but it, it is also the, the case today. We encourage to use Cloud SQL for, for fairly lightweight uh, use cases, like uh, 15 gigabyte of data, without an high uh, throughput write stream. Uh, and 
for that, it's okay. And it is most of the of, of the use case, uh, if you see. Um, for critical MySQL use cases, we advise teams to pick the, the, the in-house MariaDB uh, packaging uh, because it is uh, fully controlled by the, the, the team and it is uh, uh, the, the guarantee are, 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 are more high uh, for the, for the blah, blah, blah needs. Um, but let's say in Cloud SQL first. <clears throat> it is a, a managed services, uh, but uh, as a database team, we decided to support it uh, actively. So we provide packaging, tooling, observability, and this was mainly because we picked Cloud SQL also as a replacement for the in-house PostgreSQL packaging. So we, we decided to accompany as maximum the service team on having good practices like infras code, first class observability tool. As we know that they, they will not have the, the DBRE packaging for PostgreSQL, we had to provide this level of support on this. And uh, also not, uh, it was the same with memory store. We decided to no package um, Kubernetes uh, for, for Redis and go only on memory store. So we provided some stuff to, to help team uh, to manage this. It was mainly for, for time reason. Uh, anyway, what the team is packaging for Cloud SQL, first, uh, it is a Terraform module. It allows the team to have a standard way to name and configure things. And also, we developed a Kubernetes operator that can dynamically uh, create the Prometheus exporter pod in Kubernetes. Uh, when a new Cloud SQL is created. So by doing so, even if Cloud SQL is, is a, a Google Managed Services, you, you can use the observability tool uh, from the, your main observability stack. So it is a bridge between the, the two worlds. Uh, so here is how it works. To create a new Cloud SQL instance, we create a new Terraform configuration file uh, in GitHub. At the merge, Jenkins uh, is asking the developer if he wants to Terraform apply uh, or not. And if yes, the Cloud SQL is created. On Kubernetes side, we have the Cloud SQL exporter operator watching and waiting for changes. We pushed a new customer resource that tells that a, a new Cloud SQL instance should be monitored. Then the operator is gathering metadata, create monitoring user in, in Cloud SQL, and create a new Prometheus exporter that will gather MySQL metric uh, from the Cloud SQL uh, instance, but from the, the, the Kubernetes stack and, and can send the metric in the, in the Prometheus uh, main uh, observability platform. Uh, other than migration, nothing really complicated. How is the... <laughs> Uh, here is the, the, the initial uh, stage uh, on premise with the application, the, the two endpoints and the database cluster. Uh, I, I just created one node to, to simplify, but behind it's a, it's a Galera cluster, of course. Uh, then the first step is to move uh, the application into the cloud. Uh, I will not cover all this uh, because it, uh, it's a developer job to do it, but the application is moved to the cloud before the DB. Um, in Kubernetes, the application uh, uses service and an endpoint uh, to contact uh, other. This is not a Kubernetes class here, but uh, just a few, few basic uh, words on it. Uh, you see here that we created manually the endpoint on the, the bottom left, uh, which pointing directly to the database address. So for now, it will be a non-premise HR proxy backend, um, but on the future, it will be a Cloud SQL. And the Kubernetes service uh, will use this endpoint to route the traffic. So the, the purpose of controlling services and endpoint is to allow switching database without touching the configuration file. So the, the app is talking to its service, whatever is behind. So it's to split the two the the the, 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 the two scenario. You move the application, they, they use uh, the service, then the database team can migrate. The, um, the database without uh, touching the app. Uh, then we prepare the migration. It is the simplest uh, use case we had. So we stop everything during the migration. 
for the app in Kubernetes, we used to, to scale the deployment to zero pod. So it's one command, you can just pause your app. And then you, we change the Kubernetes endpoint to hit the, the Cloud SQL instance. Then you can start uh, the dump. Uh, I think we did a simple stream MySQL dump here for, for MySQL. But uh, you done the data. And when it's over, just restart the app by scaling back the deployment, like uh, three or five pods, and, uh, and it is done. It's brutal, but uh, it's, uh, it's easy. Um, MyDB is not so easy. So for the for the in-house MyDB packaging, uh, here are key elements of the design. Uh, we choose to do uh, our own M chart. There are different reasons for this, but uh, we did not find like matter resources uh, early 2019, and we wanted to have full control of the the packaging. It was safer for us, but anyway. This chart uh, is grouping a, a bunch of Kubernetes resources. Um, first, obviously, a stateful set with the possibility to enable uh, or not the, the Galera. Uh, if disabled, the, the purpose is generally for standalone nodes or asynchronous replica. Uh, we decided to package in the same chart a proxy SQL deployment. We like the fact that the proxy and the DB uh, is the same entity and have the same life cycle. Um, I did not mention proxy scale earlier, but we use it mainly for Galera uh, to, to, to route the right traffic to, to only one node at a time, uh, which is the best practices, the Galera best practices, and it can be done easily with the, the Kubernetes services. Uh, then uh, there is a Prometheus exporter to expose metrics. Uh, there are package as a sidecar of uh, MyDB and proxy SQL pods, and bunch of uh, job to control disk snapshot. Uh, I will um, present this further. Uh, we have also uh, a single pod deployment that runs the SLI uh, proper, uh, used to compute the, the, the service level objective. And some Kubernetes resources for security or liability, like pod disruption budget and, uh, and so on. So here is what uh, is look like when fully ready. Uh, we have the Galera cluster provided by a stateful set. The traffic routed from the application to classic Kubernetes services, which go to a proxy SQL cluster running uh, on the deployment. So it is the overall pipeline and um, can add a replica behind the Galera cluster uh, to place this. Um, so App uh, is using now three services, MyDB test proxy SQL read for production reads, or at least synchronous uh, read, proxy SQL writes for production writes, and MyDB test uh, async proxy SQL read to read into the, um, the replica. Note that here the, the proxy in front of the, of the replica is, uh, is a bit useless. We can remove it to use uh, Kubernetes only, sorry. Uh, it will do the job, but today we, we always package a proxy SQL uh, with the MyDB release. So. Um, and yeah, let's explore some fun tips. Uh, first, uh, when you do Galera uh, in a complete uh, dynamic infrastructure, it can be challenging. Uh, you probably know this well, but um, when a node starts, you, you need to give it a list of up and running node to join a cluster. But if you have the first node, the list should be empty. Uh, it tells that you, you, you have to, to bootstrap a cluster. So to have a dynamic and sure way to get the list, uh, we use a Kubernetes headless service and we ask uh, the, the, the endpoints available behind the service during the pod pre-start. The Kubernetes API will answer and give the list of pods that are ready at this time. Uh, if the list is empty, uh, well, the, the, we tell the Galera config to, to start a new cluster. If the list have a ready pods, we tell the Galera to, to join uh, the cluster. All these are done in a pre-start script. 
um, and the config is overrided depending on, on the situation. And the pod can start um, with, uh, with the right config. Uh, so liveness and readiness. Um, the, these two folks are, are key in managing uh, cube resources in production. Um, again, it's not a Kubernetes class, but uh, the, the, the liveness tells that the pod is going well and the readiness tells that the pod is okay to receive traffic. If the liveness is not validated, the pod is killed. killed sorry. If the readiness is not validated, the pod stays alive, but the application can't access it. So in the Gaia context, uh, how to play with these two uh, variables to, to, to be uh, reliable. Uh, First for liveness, we decided to use a MySQL admin and ping the server. Some uh, are using uh, TCP checks, but we wanted a, a functional ping, a, a real uh, MySQL connection. Um, then you, you can see here that we have a NOR condition that check if there is no SST in progress. This is pretty mandatory as during an SST that the MySQL is not answering, but you don't want to see the pod kill uh, because of the liveness fail, you, you need to wait for the SST to, to be complete. And for the readiness, we check the local state of the node, ensuring that the only node synced and donor are viewers ready for the application. So be sure to, to well manage the liveness and readiness, whatever the Kubernetes resource is. Uh, we are using the, the GCP uh, snapshot features to back up MySQL. And we have a, a bunch of jobs with different purposes. Uh, we have a job called Snapshot Validator that restores the snapshot on fresh standalone MyDB every hour. So creating a disk from a snapshot, uh, create the pod, attach the disk, start the pod, look at the, the readiness, the liveness, and, and finally shut down the pod. So we can validate every hour that the, our backup uh, is uh, working. Um, then we have the same mechanism, but with different name and, uh, and orchestration uh, style. Uh, for instance, uh, daily copy is a restoration we do uh, every day to expose the production data set, but without uh, being connected to the production uh, cluster. It can be used for debugging or for the, the BI team to, to stage the data. Uh, we have also the on-demand copy. So it's the same as the validator, but with, without a uh, cron job, it's just you. Uh, you restore a pod from a snapshot in, in one shot. And we also use a snapshotting to extend the Galera cluster in case of a really uh, big failure. We can stop a node, um, snapshot it, and then from this snapshot, create as many nodes uh, as we want in parallel. So if, for example, you have a big failure, like losing three nodes uh, in your cluster and the activity uh, uh, can't wait uh, several SST, uh, to, to contact, uh, um, yeah, to, 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 to work. Uh, and we, we use this procedure in emergencies so of snapshotting a disk, creating like five nodes and opening the cluster with five nodes instantly. It's pretty cool. Uh, okay, quick word about, um, I'll can do an entire talk about the SLI and SLO, but just a slide on it. We implemented a, a, an SLI prober that do simple queries in MySQL pod, and it is exposing metrics that can be used to compute like scores, uh, service level objective, error budget, and so on. Uh, and then you can do like sexy Grafana dashboard. It is pretty modern and uh, it, it be the key to, to monitor things through SLO in the future. So. Uh, I wanted to, to, to mention it here. Okay, so the MindB migration uh, was a bit more serious than Cloud SQL, uh, where everything was simply uh, shutting down during the dataset transfer. Uh, for MyDB, we succeed in having few second write interruption and with the possibility of wall backing at any time. So it was a bit more sexy to do. Um, rapidly, the initial stage is the same as before, one database, one application, multiple endpoint. Um, then we first ask the service team to move the application into GCP. At this stage, we created a Kubernetes service that point directly to the on-premise HR proxy. 
Um, so from the application point of view, the, the migration is already over. They, they are using the, their Kubernetes service to contact the DB. The main impact for them is the latency uh, to contact the database because the database itself, it's on-premise, not in the cloud. So you can have the latency. Then we installed the GCP databases with the Galera cluster and, and all the, the, the chart stuff uh, with proxy SQL. Um, we restored an extra backup from the on-premise into that uh, GCP database and set up an asynchronous replication between the on-premise cluster, the master, and the GCP, GCP cluster, the replica. So it's uh, real time. Uh, you can see that at this point, the database in GCP and Kubernetes, it's in read-only. Uh, this is mainly to prevent any mistake. Uh, at this point, all writes should still be done on premise. So we can't have a write on, uh, on GCP for now. And finally, you can see that the proxy SQL uh, is configured to point directly into an uh, on-premise cluster uh, instead of GCP. The, the configuration at the, at the initial stage it's uh, pointing to, to on-premise. At this point, we decided to expose a read endpoint uh, that route the traffic into the GCP database. We call it like a beta read to explicitly mention that is a particular uh, usage uh, in the pipeline. And, yeah, because uh, as you can see, the, the reads are forwarded to GCP databases, so which is an asynchronous replica from on-premise. And the application should know that the, the behavior compared to the, the classic endpoint is different than the synchronous reading on premise. Um, but it, it was useful to co film the whole production pipeline from the app uh, to the Kubernetes service, to the proxy SQL, and to the MariaDB cluster. Um, after the test, uh, we had the green light, the green light, sorry, uh, for, for, for the final migration because. We validated all the bridge. So the D day uh, here is um, it was the, the, the procedure. Uh, so note that the overall procedure less uh, last uh, less uh, one minute. Uh, few seconds is enough to do all the the the, the task listed uh, uh, listed here. So you are ready. So first, um, we put the on-premise cluster into read-only. So from now, all the writes uh, to the DB are, are refused. Uh, of course, we, we had validated this procedure with our product team, CTO, and so on. And a few minutes of done times uh, was acceptable. Uh, but uh, as I said, the overall switch uh, lasts less than a, a minute. So read-only, read-only. Second step is to reverse the replication stream. So from now, the on-premise cluster become the replica uh, and GCP the master. And it is real important step as it allows to roll back the procedure. Uh, so the master is now GCP. The third step is to prepare for reopening the write. So we disable the read-only mode on GCP. And finally, we change the proxy SQL configuration to use the GCP database behind the reads and the right uh, endpoints. Simple, no? A bit stressful, but simple procedure at the end. And when it's done, you just have to clean and, and decommission the, the useless part. Uh, we usually do this way after the migration, like day or, or week after. It's not really urgent. But we, you have to do to complete the migration and decommission your, your on-premise uh, data center. Uh, it, it will be quick, uh, as, a, as I think uh, I'm a bit out of time. But the, the important things to mention is that Elastic has embraced uh, the general move to Docker and Kubernetes brilliantly. Like this is now, uh, I think, the, the, the official way to run Elastic product in, uh, in 2021 with the, the ELK uh, stack. Uh, concretely, you have the Elastic Operator, uh, the Kubernetes operati uh, Elastic Operator, running on your Kubernetes cluster, which is uh, open source, and you manage custom resources to, to, to bootstrap and control the, the, the component like Elasticsearch or Kibana. Um, 
And just a quick word about the migration. It was really interesting because he, he, we implemented the double write pattern uh, inside the client, so inside the indexer. So we bootstrap an empty uh, Elasticsearch cluster into Kubernetes. Uh, and then uh, we enable the double write on the indexer. So from now, the new document are on-premise and Kubernetes. Then to get the history data, we just re-index the, the, the old data into the Kubernetes and the two data sets are, are, are now synchronized. Um, then after, whenever you want, you can uh, migrate the app uh, and uh, like decommission uh, your, your cluster. It was really a, um, a cool pattern to, to do. Um, and yeah, there's only two use cases. Uh, I would love to show you every use cases and every story behind the, the products, but uh, I got only a, a few hours, a few hours, sorry, a one hour, sorry. Uh, here is a, an overview uh, of a solution we have chosen for each product. Um, and yeah, obviously every migration was an, an adventure and a challenge. So yeah, for Cassandra, we, we created our own uh, M chart. Uh, RabbitMQ, RabbitMQ, we are using um, a chart from Bitnami. Redis uh, was replaced by memory store, Postgres by Cloud SQL. For Kafka, we use uh, an Elastic, uh, uh, sorry, a Kubernetes operator like uh, Elastic. It's from Streamz. And Couchbase was uh, completely abandoned to, to, to do uh, Redis. Uh, we, we change a lot of things on our way to do uh, infrastructure, obviously, to communicate, to accompany the developer team. This journey was like, really intense. Uh, I'm really proud of the, the, the engineer involved on the story, all the work done by everyone, uh, including the, the leadership also, who put all the confidence on, uh, on the team. Um, so yeah, I was really happy to share this with you. Uh, again, it's uh, remotely a bit sad of it, but uh, uh, thanks Perkona to, to the support and the, the resilience to keep the open source uh, database under the light. And uh, thanks for the, 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 yeah, the, the attentions. Thank you.